nearly every work of fantasy features some kind of magic sword. Whether it's a Gandalf sword Glamdring, King Arthur's Excalibur, or just that plus five Holy Avenger from your D&D game, magic weapons are part and parcel of fantasy, sometimes proving to be just as famous as the heroes that wielded them. Some magical weapons were wielded by mere mortals like King Arthur, while others were possessed by supernatural beings or gods like Thor's hammer Mjolnir or Poseidon's trident. Those kind of weapons firmly exist only in myth, but a few others straddle the line between historical fact and fiction. A good example is the sword of Attila the Hun. He clearly existed, and he probably owned a sword or two, but was his sword really a gift from Mars, the Roman god of war, as recorded by Roman historians? Probably not, and it's just as unlikely that the sword on display at the Museum of Art History in Vienna is Attila's sword, despite its claims. Nevertheless, there are a fair number of weapons that still exist today that trace their lineage back several centuries and are purported to be magical in nature, or at least were when their legendary wielders were alive. Maybe they're only attuned to that one special individual, or maybe they lost their powers over time, or more likely they were never actually magical to begin with. But even if they weren't, it's still intriguing, at least to me, that there are legendary weapons with attested, if semi-mythical histories, out there that you can see with your own eyes. So maybe they don't have special powers, but for the moment, let's put aside our skepticism and take a look at a few of the magic swords that still exist in the world today. Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar, better known as El Cid, was a legendary knight of medieval Spain. Active in the latter half of the 11th century, El Cid fought under both Christian and Muslim rulers in Iberia and ruled over Valencia from 1094 until his death in 1099. El Cid possessed two swords, known as Tizona and Colada. According to the epic poem Cantar de Mio Cid, he won Colada, worth more than a thousand marks of silver, from the Count of Barcelona in battle after the Count sent a force to stop El Cid's raid in his territory. He acquired Tizona by using Colada to cut in half the fleeing Moorish king Bucar. The Cid reached Bucar at three arms lengths from the sea. He raised up Colada, a great blow he has struck him. The carbuncles of the helmet, he has broken them off. He broke open his helmet and, leaving the rest exposed, his sword went straight down to his waist. He killed Bucard, the king from across the sea, and he won Tizon, worth 1,000 marks of gold. Ever the generous sort, El Cid granted both swords to men in his service, and it's at that point that their magical qualities come to light. Colada is gifted to Martin Antolinez, who uses it in a duel with Diego Gonzalez, where it lights up all the field. Gonzalez, even with sword in hand, saw that he would not escape with his soul, and fled the dueling field, leaving Antolinez as the victor. El Cid gave Tizona to his standard bearer, Pedro Bermudez, who unsheathed it in the duel preceding Antolinez. His opponent, Fernand Gonzalez, simply said, I am defeated, and conceded the match. In each case, the swords were so potent that their opponents gave up rather than face their wielders. These accounts come from a work of fiction, but even if they were true, you could make the case that it was their wielders rather than the swords themselves that inspired such profound fear, and Colada lighting up the battlefield could be the reflection of the sun off the blade. In any event, both swords have supposedly survived to the present day, nearly a thousand years after El Cid's death. Tizona is in the possession of the Museum of Burgos in Spain, while Colada is said to be in the possession of the Royal Palace of Madrid. Naturally, there are questions as to both swords' authenticity, not to mention their magical properties, but it's fun to think that there could be a magical sword in a museum somewhere. That sounds like it would make for a great heist movie. The Phra Seng Khan Chai Si, or Venerable Sword of Victory, is part of the royal regalia of Thailand. According to the Bangkok Post, it serves to remind people of the king's traditional role as warrior protecting the kingdom, and is emblematic of the king's valor and his supreme power as the ruler. The sword, along with the other pieces of regalia, are currently on display at the Museum of the Grand Palace in Bangkok. The legend behind the sword is that it was discovered in 1784 by a Cambodian fisherman and given to King Rama I. Supposedly, when the sword entered the city of Bangkok, it caused seven lightning bolts to strike the city all at once. These strikes destroyed several buildings and damaged the central gates of the Great Palace. 
Fortunately, it doesn't appear that any other catastrophes have been linked to the sword. But if I was a rival country to Thailand, I don't think I'd want to go up against a ruler who owns a sword that can call down lightning. Then again, maybe we shouldn't trust magic items dredged up by fishermen from the bottom of a lake or stream. Another legendary sword in possession of a royal family is the Kusanagi no Tsurugi in Japan. Like the Sword of Victory, this sword is part of the royal regalia and symbolizes imperial valor. But unlike Thailand's sword, you'll never see it, even if you do somehow become the Emperor of Japan. Which if you do, let me know because that would be pretty cool. Of the weapons covered in this video, the Kusanagi no Tsurugi, which means grass cutting sword, has the most fantastical origin story. It was found by the god Susanoo inside the body of an eight-headed serpent, or more specifically its fourth tail. He gave the sword to his sister, the goddess Amaterasu, as payment for killing one of her followers. It eventually wound up in the hands of the semi-legendary prince Yamato Takaru, who lived in the 1st and 2nd centuries AD. In one incident, Yamato was lured into a grassy field that was set on fire around him. He swung the sword around to cut the grass, giving it its current name, and found that he could also use it to control the wind and send the fire back toward the warlord who had set the trap for him. Other tales refer to the sword's ability to grant invincibility to its wielder or call down lightning. Since the year 688, the sword has been kept at Atsuta Shrine in Nagoya. It was sent there from the Imperial Palace, where it was blamed for the Emperor falling ill and dying. Only the Shinto priests who care for it are allowed to see it. An account from 1725 refers to a priest, Matsuoka Masanao, seeing the sword during maintenance of its outer box and describing it thus. The sword was about 82 centimeters long. Its blade resembled a calamus leaf. The middle of the sword had a thickness from the grip about 18 centimeters with an appearance like a fish spine. The sword was fashioned in a white metallic color and well maintained. Legend has it that the other priests who viewed the sword died, with Matsuoka the sole survivor. Because of its divine nature, virtually nobody is allowed to see the sword. When Emperor Naruhito ascended to the throne in 2019, the sword was present, but hidden in a box. Putting aside questions of its magical nature, is the current Kusanagi no Tsurugi really 2,000 or more years old? During the 12th century, it was supposedly thrown into a river to prevent it from falling into the hands of enemy forces during the Genpei War, and some believe that the current sword is a replica. Regardless of its true nature, the Kusanagi no Tsurugi is arguably the most sacred sword in a country whose people revere swords. So why are swords often considered magical in the first place? This probably goes back to ancient times when swords were first crafted. A smith who could take chunks of metal from the earth and turn them into a weapon was practically a magician. And the killing power of early swords would have been as revolutionary on the battlefield as guns or artillery would be in the future, making them seem almost otherworldly. This belief in magical weapons was clearly passed through the ages all the way down to the present day where it's ubiquitous in games and other media. So the next time you pick up a magic weapon in an RPG, take a moment to think about its history, or maybe its future. Hundreds of years after your character is gone, maybe it'll wind up in a museum where people can doubt if it ever had any powers to begin with. Seriously though, don't mess with the King of Thailand. I hope you enjoyed this video and it got you thinking about the true nature of magical weapons throughout history. Feel free to like and subscribe and let me know what you'd like me to cover next. Thanks for watching.